and gentlemen, and welcome to New York City, and welcome to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, also known as the Met. And it's one of my favorite museums in the world. There are many reasons to come to the Met. Sadly, I suffer very easily from museum fatigue and find that the best way to avoid museum fatigue is to fly through most of the museum and only look at what you really care about. But before we get to what I really care about, here's a few of the things you could see at the Met if you like. While rampaging through the museum on our way to the destination of our pilgrimage, we stumbled upon this little sculpture, supposedly by Michelangelo. The sculpture is first recorded at the house of Jacopo Galli, a rich banker who bought Michelangelo's sculpture of Bacchus from the original owner, Cardinal Riario. Galli was also Michelangelo's banker and friend and helped him secure the commission for the Pietà for a French cardinal. Jacopo Galli passed away in 1505, but is known to have owned a cupid sculpted by young Michelangelo. In 1556, the piece is first recorded at Galli's house and identified as Apollo. But as Jacopo Galli was not alive at the time, this might have been a misunderstanding. Later when the piece was in Villa Borghese in Rome, the piece had been retitled Cupid. So who knows, at least it seems plausible that this is a Michelangelo, and the sculpture sure is beautiful. In the Grand Hall of European Sculpture, we reach our destination. Ugolino and his Sons by Jean-Baptiste Carpeau. With this sculpture, Carpeau kickstarts the Romantic period of sculpture, moving on from Neoclassicism. The story is from Dante's Inferno. The peace and traitor, Count Ugolino, his sons and his grandsons are imprisoned and sentenced to die of starvation. In Dante's story, before dying, the children begs their father to eat their bodies. Here is the passage from the Inferno. Father, our pain, they said, will lessen if you eat us. You are the one who clothed us with this wretched flesh. We plead for you to be the one who strips it away. And I, already going blind, groped over my brood, calling to them, though I had watched them die for two long days. And then, hunger had more power than even sorrow over me. Carpo is depicting the moment of decision, Ugolino's transition from man to monster as he decides to eat his kin. Depicting the moment the decision is made, is something Michelangelo is the master of. Even Michelangelo's seated figures are dynamic because they are milliseconds away from standing up and moving. Carpo would have known this. This sculpture is made in Rome. Carpo attended the École de Beaux-Arts in Paris and he won the Prix de Rome in 1854. And the Prix de Rome is a scholarship to go live and study in Rome. He spent a lot of time studying Michelangelo during his stay. Compositionally, he was influenced by Lequan and his sons, a 1st century BCE Hellenistic sculpture, which was dug up during Michelangelo's time in Rome around 1506. So they actually share a lot of the same influences. Where Carpo departs, however, is in his superbly naturalistic depiction of Ugolino's children. An interesting side note being that the child that is sculpted most lifelike, as far as technique goes, is the youngest child who is dead by Ugolino's side. Apparently, Carpo sketched sick and dying children as part of his preparation for the piece. So perhaps he was able to do the most elaborate or accurate sketches of already dead or sleeping children. Carpo kind of lives in two worlds with this sculpture, the world of neoclassicism and the world of romanticism, which he kind of invents in a way. The character of Ugolino looks back to the Greeks and to Michelangelo while the children are looking forward, pioneering a new style of sculpture. The sculpture was hotly contested during its making. The winner of the Prix de Rome was supposed to make a sculpture in the neoclassical style inspired by the Greeks. That's why they went to Rome to study. They would study ancient Greek sculpture there. The subject of the sculpture was supposed to be off limits. Dante is not biblical, not classical or historical. 
There were also limits on the scope of the sculpture they were supposed to make. Three figures maximum. Carpeau's group contains five. This piece needed to be a masterpiece for Carpeau and the Prix de Rome not to look like fools. So in a sense, Carpeau was a bit of a rebel and he opened the door for other rebels to come. With me on this pilgrimage was not only the beautiful Neve, who you saw in slow motion at the beginning of the video, we also traveled with Mitch Shea, the director of sculpture at the Florence Academy of Art. He's a brilliant sculptor and I learned a lot from listening to what he had to say while we were looking at the Ugolino and his children's sculpture. His thoughts will be mixed with mine here. I just thought it was important to note that not all that I will mention while we speak on the technical aspect of the sculpture and what we can learn from studying a piece like this came from me. Most of it probably came from Mitch, to be honest. I'll link his Instagram below so you can go check out his beautiful work there. Okay, so let's talk the technical aspect of sculpture. The sculpture was executed in clay, then cast in bronze, and later carved into marble for the International Exposition in 1867. So I think we can look at this marble and take lessons from it and apply them to clay. Let's first talk about the overall before we get into more specific details. The composition is the first thing we see and react to when we approach a sculpture from a distance. So first and foremost, a sculpture must work from a distance. There's an interesting and excellent contrast between this mass of bodies by Carpeau and right behind it, the Burgers of Calais by Rodin. Let's just say that one works really well and the other is a bit of a royal mess. Ugolino and his children could easily have been a mess. An impenetrable mass of bodies, if not for some excellent compositional choices by Carpeau. The composition is balanced, yet not symmetrical. Having Ugolino lean to the side with the smallest children kind of helps accomplish this. This also means that the posture, the pose, is dynamic. There is motion and gesture here, even though the figure of Ugolino is seated, and he's seated quite heavily. Try yourself to sit like Ugolino is for a second, and you'll realize that it's not very comfortable. But having Ugolino in this pose gives the piece drama and action. Seated figures become very boring very easily if you don't take care to design the pose well. The negative shapes between the characters give the piece room to breathe and keeps the mass of figures from becoming really, really claustrophobic. All the negative shapes, meaning kind of empty spaces, are very well designed and doesn't allow our gaze to wander off the piece. Every line takes our eye around the sculpture. Notice, for example, how the head of the boy on the left leans towards the body of Ugolino, taking our eyes up towards Ugolino's face. Notice how the hand of the same child curves inwards towards the arm of the older child in front. We're transported around the piece by the lines that make up the piece. Notice from the back view here that the legs of the two reclining children are quite symmetrical and that our eyes are kept inside the piece, on the piece, by the legs of the standing children. Also notice how the thigh of the reclining child on the left are fairly horizontal versus the child on the right there's also contrast in the way the two standing children are standing as well. So even though it's fairly symmetrical from this back view, he does find ways to break the symmetry in a subtle fashion, creating a dynamic and interesting piece. All this stuff seems really, really trivial, I know, but it's crucial, I think, to the success of this piece. And this sort of stuff doesn't happen on accident. It's very, very well thought through, very well designed. The side views are littered with diagonals traveling in different directions, which is a hallmark of the Baroque. Diagonals going through a piece creates a sense of action, a sense of drama. Contrasted by the Renaissance, for example, where the sculptures were more stable and often with an open contour, without elements traveling across the contour. Think of Michelangelo's David, for example, which is kind of the perfect example of a high Renaissance sculpture. Here, we have a lot of stuff moving into the contours, arms, legs, bodies even, and it happens from every view. Something very interesting to note from the side view that through discussion Mitch and I believe we discovered, it seems like he is missing some mass at the back of the head. 
Now, if this was done on purpose, and not because the block of marble was too small or something, which seems unlikely that they would make such a planning mistake, we believe that it was done to visually make the sculpture more appealing from the front. Ugolino's head is leaning slightly forward, and if Carpo was to have sculpted the fullness of the skull, the front view would have had more head than face. When you lean your head forwards, you can see more of your skull and less of your face, because of perspective. And we think he tried to combat this by giving Ugolino as little skull as possible without making it obvious and ridiculous. Also notice the plane of the face. He's making sure the features are not entirely hidden in shadow because of the head leaning forward. If it leans a little further forward, the entire face is going to become shadow. And again, I think this is very likely done on purpose in order to get the psychological effect he was after without shrouding the face completely in shadow. This serves as an excellent example of how you can achieve certain effects, but you'll have to make compromises in order to achieve them. You balance on a knife's edge when you're doing this, and so you have to get it right. Which, of course, Carpo did. Something that we perhaps not do enough of in today's day and age, because we're trying to make our molds easier perhaps, I don't know, is creating huge gaps and depths in our sculpture which in turn leaves deep recessed shadows creating strong contrasts and dramatic effects. This is especially apparent here between the calves of Ugolino, which easily could have been compressed together tightly, but it's not. There's a big gap there, leaving a really really dark shadow between them. And you'll find several of these in other places on the piece, even though most are less apparent and less extreme. A lesson that gets taught in pencil drawing classes is to leave darker shades underneath the foot where the feet lift off the ground and less contrast where the weight of the body is brought down on the foot. And this is typically underneath the toe, the ball of the foot and the heel where most of the weight is distributed. Carpo seems to use this same principle here in his sculpture. Here on Ugolino's feet, where the toes are digging into the flesh of the other toes, the contrast seems less than where there is less weight bearing down. This might be a material thing perhaps, because it's in marble, but it's very interesting to note and perhaps something to attempt in clay. The same thing happens here on the arm of the reclining boy on the right. Where he wants to indicate weight, he creates a shorter, more abrupt turn of the form, and where there is less weight, he allows the form to turn slowly away from the light. I think this is comparable to line quality, something draftsmen have to consider all the time. And it's definitely something I need to incorporate, or at least try to incorporate, into my work in the future. As far as thinking of psychology, the difference between the children and Ugolino is very noteworthy. Ugolino is a monster of a man bulging muscle and bones. About as overmodeled as they get, except Carpo has been able to do it in a very tasteful way. The transitions are not overmodeled, it's the volumes that he has squeezed everything out of. This keeps the sculpture from looking flat. You can get away more easily with overmodeling if it's the volumes that are overmodeled and not the sharpness of your transitions. The children are perhaps the best example of lifelike modeling ever done in my book. They look so alive and so real, which only serves to further contrast their humanity and the humanity Ugolino is seconds away from leaving behind. As you can see, there is plenty to learn from studying the old masters. Instead of spending 10 hours at the Met looking at everything for less than a minute each, Find the pieces you truly admire and inspect and study them thoroughly for an hour. You'll get much more out of your visits to the museum this way. As an artist, seeing the work is not enough. Learning from the work and taking those lessons with us and using them in our own work is a way more useful approach. And you can tax deduct your visit in good conscience, knowing your work will improve from your visit to the museum. I hope you enjoyed the video, click the thumbs up if you did, subscribe of course, there is a new video every week. Check out the links below in the description for materials, deals on Skillshare, and support me on Patreon if you want to see more of the content on this channel. Thank you for watching, 
stay creative, and I'll see you in the next one. Thank you.